for me, making non-fiction films is uh, the same thing as part of making film, fiction films. I can't conceive of making a fiction film without making um, a, a, a full research about everything concerning that, that movie. Uh, very often I end up doing a documentary on the subject that I'm going to film. So, uh, so for me, they go together completely. Um, uh, I do a documentary work on every fiction film, and I try to introduce fiction in the documentaries that I, that I made, because um, I like to make documentaries about characters, about people. My way of doing uh, documentaries uh, uh, is just to, to go and to have a, a, a subject, and of course to know as much as possible about that subject and to film as much as possible and then to do the, the documentary and the editing. I mean, how can you know ahead of time what you're going to be discovering? It's, it's, a, it's an adventure, it's a discovery. All the new wave which uh, I was, uh, you know, I was surrounded, I was, uh, it was part of my, my background at the beginning, um, was influenced by uh, the documentary aspect of uh, filmmaking. Uh, André Bazin wrote very important uh, pieces about uh, documentary and fly RT and Louisiana story. Then Jean Rouge came along, he was an anthropologist who was making documentaries and made a movie called uh, Moi Noir, uh, I a Black, it was a black man of, of uh, uh, Africa. And then Jean-Luc Godard, when he wanted to start uh, Abou de Souffle, he wanted to call it Moins Blanc. Uh, and that was an homage to Jean Rouge. So there was always uh, uh, an interpenetration of the two. And of course, one of the movies that influenced me and the whole new wave the most, outside of uh, uh, Rome, Open City, is uh, Almania Les Zero, Germany, Year Zero which was filmed in the ruins of Berlin um, just after the war. And there was a very strong documentary aspect because you could not recreate a, a capital in ruins like that. I rarely cut uh, clippings in the press about things to put them in a folder. And uh, when I do, it's a sure sign that uh, a very high interest in that. And eventually I end up doing a movie about, about whatever I'm, I'm collecting clips of. Um, and uh, I was uh, cutting things about uh, Amin Dada, about all the crazy telegrams that he was sending that were really completely extraordinary to me. So I wanted to find out more about him. I wanted to, to know more. I wanted to understand. And uh, uh, there was a television program that was doing portraits of heads of state. And uh, I made a deal with them that I would go there and I would do a portrait of Amin Dada, but uh, if it didn't work, they would have the, the television program. But if it worked the way I wanted, I wanted to have the right to make a movie first, and then they will have their hour for television. And uh, it worked uh, beyond my expectation. At a certain point, uh, I couldn't believe what I was filming. I couldn't believe what I was getting. and. I really literally had the feeling that I was walking one inch above the floor. I had a feeling of total unreality. Uh, it, it was extraordinary. The whole idea was that it would be a self-portrait. That was the secret of the whole movie, was that I went there to propose him to do a self-portrait of himself. And that uh, I would film whatever he wanted me to film, as long as he was in the frame, because like every head of state, he started saying, well, you should go and film the factories or this or that. And, uh, I managed to, uh, uh, to convince him that he had to be in the frame since 
he has such a, a strong screen presence, it ended up being quite extraordinary. Because this is, of course, uh, a caricature. It's also a caricature even of a dictator, but it has something very true. And that uh, I think that every uh, political man uh, is portrayed through Amin Dada. I think there is, there is a little bit of all of them. Uh, I think uh, every man in power has something in common. I, I always uh, was fascinated trying to understand the nature of evil and how does it work, uh, how, how somebody evil actually is. And uh, uh, I mean, that is very interesting because he is somebody extremely charming, uh, is very funny, and there is uh, uh, an innocence in him that is totally disarming. And there is a life force and an innocence that, that is extraordinary. And at the same time, you know that this is a face of evil. Normally, when you do a documentary, you do a lot of hours in order to get good footage. And it was all good. It was all good all the time, every time I, the camera was on him. And so I discovered that uh, I, I didn't need really uh, so many hours because things were starting to repeat themselves. It, it, it started to become repetitious. So. Uh, it was really quite extraordinary because he, the movie for somebody who was living in Uganda at the time is the most boring thing because that's exactly what you could see every night on television. And I showed that in the movie. This was the normal reality of Uganda. And he was on television every day. And uh, so this was just a reality. It's not that I tricked him into saying things that he would have not said otherwise. Um, I just asked him to, uh, to behave the way he was behaving every day. And, and the only difference was that uh, Nestor Almendros was filming and not the, not the local television. Nestor Almendros uh, uh, came to Paris uh, from Cuba and he had made some documentaries there. Uh, I didn't know that. Uh, I just saw a guy that was a political refugee that had no money at all, and that was willing for, to work for free as anything on movies. And of course, the only thing he could do was to take photographs because the crew was there. And uh, uh, we discovered that he was a cameraman one day when on a on a movie of Romer in Place de l'Etoile, the cameraman walked out of the movie because he, he got tired or he was nervous or whatever. And uh, uh, Nestor stood there and, and, and the cameraman had left the camera on the ground. And Nestor was there taking photos and he said, you know, I know how to operate those things. I said, oh, good, so you become the, you become the DP. And uh, that's how we discovered that mm, mm, he had done many documentary work in Cuba. It was me, Nestor, and the sound man. And uh, to reload the camera, we had to do it ourselves, which I was not good at it, and Nestor was not good at it. So it was pathetic. We, had, we were reloading uh, the film uh, our, ourselves. It, it, it actually got pretty frustrating because we missed a few things because we were reloading ourselves. We were using reversal film, which is a, a very good quality. At the time, it was the best possible quality. And uh, uh, only recently, when I did the transfer to, to video, instead of starting from the, because then it was blown up to 35, but for, for this transfer, uh, I started back with the absolute original ectachrome uh, footage, which I had never seen because it was like a negative. It, it was a positive, but it was treated as negative and it was used for... The, but it was something that I had never seen. 
and I was so ravished because the color looked 10 times better than, than the 35 millimeter prints that I had seen all my life. So this was a wonderful discovery to see that we could start from the absolute original ectachrome. We would show up every day to the Ministry of, I don't know if it was called propaganda or information, information ministry. And, uh, and we would say, so is he going to see us today? What is he doing? The, what does he want to do today? Uh, and they would always have something for us to go uh, or something that he had organized or that we had uh, concocted together. And of course, I encouraged him every time. Uh, he said, uh, he started talking about the Golan Heights and how it should be taken back from the, uh, from the Israeli. And uh, uh, I, I said, how, how, do you, how, do you, how are you going to do this? Oh, oh, I, I can show you, I can show you. And then we find ourselves uh, a few days later with the Ugandan army and he's on a tank and we're, w there is a little hill that he has decided is the Golan Heights and, and we're taking over the Golan Heights. He is he's making the movie. The proof is that at one point a helicopter comes and he says to the camera, film the helicopter. And Nestor takes it and pans to the, to the helicopter. So this was the relationship we had, this was the game, the game was the camera has a power. The camera has an, an incredible power. It's a, it's, a, it's a tool of power where you can have people do things for the camera. And he had the political power. And so it was some kind of, of a mind game of some kind of game between the power in the camera and the political camera. It was some kind of weird tango. <laughs> Now, there was one scene where uh, I had to insist a lot. I was telling him, you know, people are going to think that you are a dictator if we don't see how uh, you rule. So we have, to, we have to show you at the head of a council when you, when you give advices to, to the people and the government. We, we want to see how, uh, how, it, how it works, how it functions. And he was not too, too crazy about it, and I kept insisting. I said, yeah, no, really, we, we have to. We have to have that in the movie. And that's how uh, we have the, this famous scene of the council that, uh, for me, it's totally uh, extraordinary. I mean, I, nobody could invent a thing like that. My telephone is simple. If you telephone me at 2241, where's that, 3 o'clock in the morning, I get your telephone, I speak to you, and uh, if you want a briefing, I can brief you completely until you understand. And when you go there, any reporters wants to ask you about Uganda. I think you are well equipped with all informations. You can brief them. You should not fear. You should not say, no, it is not my duty. If you are that, you are not Ugandans. And if I am to get this, you are not a minister at all. One day we go to the minister, uh, uh, to that place where we were going every morning, and we saw everything is up in arm, there, there is an unusual activity, there, there is a big problem somewhere. So I start asking, and uh, they tell me, oh yes, no, this is terrible. Uh, His Excellency has uh, uh, seen himself on television shaking the hand of a very important Arab uh, person uh, with his left hand, and it's not done there. And uh, he, uh, he is in, in, enraged against the cameraman. And so the same day we saw him a little later, and uh, uh, I said, oh my God, this poor cameraman. And so uh, I said, you know, it has nothing to do with the cameraman. This is something that happens in every country all the time. It's just an editor that has put the film in reverse. And so it looks like the other hand when it, when it screened. And he says, aha, it's the editor. I didn't know the cameraman was already dead. 
And now I was responsible for the death of the editor. So I decided, okay, I better not speak anymore. Because, you know, everybody was being given to the crocodile. And sometimes at night, suddenly the, the, the electricity would run out. And it was not every time, but I was told that very often was because the dam was uh, stopping to function, the, the, the tur turbine, because the crocodile were, eat were, were uh, not eating all the dead bodies. There were too many. And the dead bodies were getting caught in the, the thing, and so there was no more electricity. And there was one thing that I really wish I could have uh, I could have filmed because that was very extraordinary. There was some meeting uh, with business people that were coming to invest, and he had uh, four businessmen in jacket and ties, white, carry him the same way the the um, the white man used to be carried in the old days in the colony times. Uh, on, on a chair and with, I don't know how you call it, you know, this. So there were four people, he was sitting in some kind of chair throne and there were four white men who was carrying him to a meeting. There is a photo of that and that's a fantastic scene that I would have loved to have filmed. And I would love to actually do a part two. I don't know if it will be a, a, another hour and a half, but certainly a, a half an hour, I keep dreaming about uh, going there and see. I have the scenes in my head. The, maybe I'm, I'm just doing a fiction movie, but I have the scene in my head. From what I know, that he lives in a modest uh, condominium with uh, one of his four wives and 25 of his 50 children, and they go picnicking in the desert, uh, in big uh, minivans, and then in the morning he goes and and leaves to the to the world press at a stand where he can consult it without buying all the papers. Uh, so I already have the scenes, but I don't know if they correspond to the uh, to the reality. And of course, I would never do anything that doesn't correspond to reality. But uh, I'm pretty sure it's a, it's a little bit like that. And I'm sure he has not changed so much. There, were, there was something very interesting at the end of the first interview, uh, because he, he said, uh, now i got to finish, uh, I have time. You know who I'm meeting here, and you have to stop your cameras, because I'm meeting, he was very proud, I'm meeting the whole group of the Black September. Those were the, 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 the group, I think, that was responsible for Munich. So they, they were real, the, the, the hardcore Palestine terrorists. And he was very proud. He says, they're coming to see me, and we're, I'm meeting with them. And uh, so we turned off our camera, and we see, we see him embracing a whole group of men. And then, uh, a little later in the interview, um, uh, I asked him, out of curiosity, uh, and it's in the movie, say, what would you do if someone uh, uh, takes a plane and land, land in Uganda, if, if a terrorist? And then he says, oh, they're welcome. And, you know, I never know if maybe because of the movie and Tebe happened, because he was announcing there that they would be welcome to land in his country. And uh, uh, so that was actually that, mm, that passage of the film uh, after Entebbe that made so much noise, uh, it allowed the movie to come out in America. Uh, the movie had been shown uh, before in America at the new director's uh, series in the Lincoln Center. And at the time, it was quite extraordinary because there were not many, but there were like 50 or 100 uh, extremist uh, Jewish protesters.
that were from, from a little group that were protesting in front of the, the theater because, uh, because I mean, I mean Dada says things in, in the movie that are not countered, you know, there's, and, but it's obviously, I mean, uh, for me, I, I don't think we need to counter and to say that he's wrong, but anyway. Uh, it was very funny because they were protesting outside and inside the projectionist was receiving phone calls of black extremist movement that were saying, uh, you can't play this movie, there's going to be bombs and, and so on. So uh, the extremists of both sides uh, were against the movie and I was in heaven. <laughs>
to get close to a dictator like that and, and to get really inside his, his mind and the way, the way things actually are, are working is, is, is something very unique. And I must say it's a little bit because of his innocence that we were able to do that. And so that, that's the only thing which makes me feel a little bad. But then I have to think about all, the, uh, all, the, all his victims, and then I feel better. <laughs> there is a lot of humor in him. And I actually did the movie to try to understand how much humor, how much seriousness, what was this mixture. And uh, I was trying to understand him. And right now, I can watch this movie again, and I still don't know. And I still don't know. When he says that he's collected money for the, for the British who are starving, and, and we see that uh, he has done it a couple of times, and I don't know if it's, a, it's an ironic slap in the face to the ex-colonial power, or if it comes from the heart, and if it's serious. And I could never really be sure. And uh, this is fantastic. And I, and I don't know how it could be both, how it could be both. Um, uh, for me, this is a subject of endless fascination. And this is the one of my movies that I never get tired of looking. I could watch this movie a thousand times. I never get tired.